Well, welcome along to the Know My Faith Monday podcast. I'm Rob Holding, and my guest uh, this week is uh, Michael Cook from CMI Creation Ministries International. Welcome along. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. Now, the, this, this is great. You've got a little tract here. Uh, evolution or biblical creation, does it matter? Does it matter? Jump, and, right. jump straight in. Does it matter? Uh, Do I need to believe in creation? Well, it's a really good point. A lot of people think, well, it's just a side issue. Just uh, preach about Jesus, you know, tell them that he, no, he loves I believe them Jesus all. died on the cross for my sins and rose again. So what more do I need? That's right. Well, if you go back to the beginning, of course, and we talk about Genesis being the foundational book of the Bible, and Genesis chapter 1 talks about God being the creator. Yep. So it's a great place to start. And as we see, and hopefully we'll go through in this, uh, this talk about Genesis is foundational, creation is foundational. And so it's, it is important. Yeah. One of the things that we like doing at Know My Faith is digging deeper and finding those uh, historic cultural roots uh, of our faith of Christianity. And part of that is the, the understanding that Genesis is real history and Jesus took it as real history. He did. He didn't see it as analogy. Um, before we get to that, though, interesting Although you are a speaker for Creation Ministries, you've got this this Jewish tie in that you met your Kiwi wife. I did, yes. In a kibbutz in Israel. That's right. A very quick update on that. Yes, back in 1984, uh, I was living in Nelson, and my wife Desma, she was in the Waikato, went up in uh, Tiaraha and living in Hamilton. And both of, our, both of us looked back at this time of opening up uh, Challenge Weekly. You remember Challenge Weekly, yep. that classic yep. Christian newspaper? And this advert stood out. It said, focus on Israel, kibbutz volunteers, Christian uh, kibbutz volunteers wanted. And hmm, I was planning an OE, and somehow that just really stood out to me. So I'd like to go to Israel. I don't know much about Israel. So I signed up, and sure enough, on the 3rd of April, 1984, I met my <laughs> wife, Desma. She was just a, you know, another Kiwi there. Another but, Kiwi. We, but you know, volunteering that's, that's on right. The Lord led us on, so it was an amazing time. Yeah. And we How had, long did you stay there? I was there seven months, and Desma got there before me, and she was there ten months. Yeah. So for us, it was a really neat time. In 1984, the kibbutz movement was very strong, um, as along with uh, Moshe Vim as well. Yeah. And so we just learned so much. We travelled the country, and it was a great grounding. Okay. Have you been back? Yes, we've been back three times since then. Yeah. Back in 1989, and then in 2003, took our children back, and then in 2014, we were there just at the time when all the rocket attacks were happening, you know. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. We actually yeah. uh, got there. So we caught up with friends in Jerusalem, and it was an amazing time. And each time we go back, we see how the country has just expanded, the infrastructure, the, oh, it's, it's amazing, developed, isn't it? It's just yeah. over those years, yeah. those decades, it's just blossomed. The desert is blossoming, the cities yeah. are blossoming. And um, what did I see the other day? They have they have this machine. It's, it's huge. It's probably about the size of this, this office. Um, but it creates water out of thin air. It's drinkable water out of thin air. You know, the whole thing about you know, the Israelis, the, the science, their technology, their innovation, engineering yeah. is just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. From irrigation and so on, they just uh, a real blessing. And you can see God's hand is, is blessing the land and the people. Absolutely. What got you uh, involved in creationism? Were, were, you, I mean, were you brought up in the church? You like they go, oh yes, that Genesis, God created Adam 6,000 years ago. Yep, fine, no problem, I believe it. No, not quite. It was a slightly different journey. Um, slightly different? Yes. I was actually born in England, and we came out when I was a child and, and to, to Nelson, and um, mum and dad were great pew-warming Anglicans, you know, C of E, yep. and uh, they, they had, a, I guess, a faith. They went to church and took us along, went to Sunday school, but it wasn't until uh, I was about eight years old, my mum had an amazing medical um, difficulty, uh, but she was healed through prayer and so on. Dad's uh, workmates were talking about this Jesus, and we believe that he can heal, and they prayed. Yeah. And uh, Dad said, well, you know, what's this all about? And it was their friendship and their yeah, love. He's a good C of E man. Yes, right, yes. <laughs> and yeah. um, Dad actually had a, a person come to him at one lunchtime and said, Alan, are you, are you a Christian? And Dad said, of course I am. I, I, I go to church. I was christened and so on. Now, do you know Jesus? And he said, what do you mean? And um, this colleague led him to the Lord in the car at lunchtime. And I saw Mum and Dad just change radically over that time. Mum was yeah. healed, and she's still with us now at 88. Yeah, and so um, you know, I gave my heart to the Lord at every boys' rally camp as an eleven-year-old. Yeah, as you do, uh, so as you do, did, yeah. Yep. yeah. Even though we were Anglicans, I went to the brethren, uh, yep. and it was a fantastic time. I remember that, and I remember Jesus being really real to me at that time. But when I went to high school, I was taught um, geography at Waimea College in Richmond and Nelson. Yep. And I had a very influential geography teacher, and she put up on the board all these different diagrams of rock strata and dinosaur bones. And I remember clearly she said, some people believe that God created the heavens and the earth and so on, but we know that's not true because of science. 
Now, I didn't yeah. lose my faith, but for me, that really... You'd start... Uh, yeah, well, see, yeah. see, my wife did. Um, not lo- I like what Toza said. He said, nobody really loses their faith. They just choose to put it on the mm. background. That's right. Um, but Sharon, very similar, in, you know, got that same teaching in high school and go, oh, well, if science says that, the Bible must be wrong. Mm. Um, and... You know, it's, I mean, obviously, obviously, I love uh, creation ministry. So I, I love explaining uh, biblical creationism to people, the scientific side of it. We go back to the man that we all love to hate, Darwin. Mm-hmm. I think Darwin, in a lot of ways, can be forgiven for expostulating his theory of evolution, because the science of his day mm, that's right. allowed him to do that. But that's nearly 200 years ago now, and the science of today does not support Darwinian evolution. But we're still being taught that in schools. We are, yeah. And, and I think, sadly, so many Christians that don't have the biblical view of creation hold on to this ancient 150-year-old scientific stronghold, and they still insert that into their faith, the, the gap theory, the long ages. Well, that's, that's right, because you know, we're brought up in a secular education system, so even now, from the cradle right through our preschool, our schooling, what we see on TV, what we read in National Geographic and so on, it's just reinforcing this idea of millions of years, there is no God, everything came about by naturalistic chance over huge amounts of time. Yep. But yeah, it's a good question. Would Darwin still be an uh, evolutionist if he lived now? Um, the, yeah, would, then, yeah. would he change his name to Richard Dawkins? Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so you're yeah. right. He was a, his thinking. This whole idea of how deep time came in through the early, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, and how that affected chain after chain of people who uh, wrote and popularized deep time to yep. free science from from Moses. Yeah. From, yeah, they the, wanted to get rid of that, the Bible. Yeah. So was that was that Charles Lyell. Yeah. The, the, uh, one of the that, free science from Moses. Or free it was actually people. Huxley. Huxley. Yeah. He yeah, yeah, tried yeah. to popularize this, and, and Lyell. Yes, yeah, so Lyell spoke yeah. about freeing it, but Huxley popularized it. So what what a lot of people don't understand is that I mean we we love conspiracy theories <laughs> these days. I mean, and at the moment I'm getting all these texts or messages from people saying go from Facebook and go from this. You know, over to here because this has been taken over uh, and you know it's, it's all this one world conspiracy to hide this and hide this what we don't re- know and understand is that Darwin wasn't just looking for scientific answers to life he was looking to free follow on from this thing of Huxley to free the world and society mm. From Moses, from the Bible, from Genesis. That's right, yeah, because um, Charles Darwin actually was trained in theology, Yeah. You know, um, but he had a lot of disappointments in his life, and I think it was his daughter Annie, when she died at age 10, he had a real bitterness against God, how could this happen? And um, I think this whole idea of, you know, how could a God of love allow bad things to happen? And he looked at nature, yeah. this whole thing about the, the horrible things we see in nature, and how can a good God allow that to happen? And that's what uh, Sir David Attenborough talks about, doesn't he? Yeah. He, you know, yeah. he just says that I don't want to believe in a God that causes, you know, that created all this horrible stuff. That creates such a problem for, uh, again, for Christians. Or let's use your dad as an example, or your mum and dad as, as great C of E people, church people. You get the, the the church religiosity that comes through, but when things like when life happens and hits you like that, my my ten year old daughter has an incurable disease and I prayed and I prayed mm-hmm. and I prayed and she still died. That's a hard one, isn't it? If yeah. you don't have a biblical, I want to want to grab the Bible, you know, I'm going to grab it and hold on to it. If you don't have a, a deep biblical understanding of who God is, that can throw your faith. It can, yeah. You know? And Absolutely. you start looking elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You, you start trying to you say, oh, well, if this isn't true, there must be another truth. And that's, as you say, that's what drove Darwin. It's one of the factors. One yes, of the factors, yes, yeah. was. And, of course, he'd had this whole thing popularised about deep time, therefore that the account that's plain in the Bible of a recent um, creation and a worldwide flood and so on, that didn't stack up in his scientific understanding. Yeah. So he started to, you know, the erosion occurred. Um, but this whole yeah. thing about can it, you know, the goodness of God in the face of, of a fallen world, yeah. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. And I mean, there's the verses I was just preaching and, and using one the other day. You know, uh, we know that all things work together for good for those that love okay, the yeah. Lord and are the called according to His purposes. But my ten year old daughter died. How can that be good? Mm. 
You know, and it's unless you have that deep relationship with Jesus, which your, your father's workmates talk to him about. So let, let's go back to, to, to Michael yes, okay. in high school, um, getting told by your science teacher that, you know, while we now know science says this, that didn't ring right with you. Well, that's right. No, it seemed convincing. I really respected her. She was one of those teachers, you know, you have, and she was funny and um, knowledgeable yep. and you know, a great teacher, one you really hung on every word. And um, But I remember just struggling with this. It seemed so convincing, but I knew that God was real. I'd seen my mum healed. I knew that Jesus had made a difference in my life. So I didn't lose my faith, absolutely, yep. but I struggled. And if anyone asked me, what do you believe on, I didn't really know. Okay. So it cut me, it, it, um, how can I put it, it really closed me down in a way. You know, I didn't know what I believed. Was it important enough for you to, to, to research what you believed, or was it just one of those things you go, oh, well, that, no, that makes sense, and well, you put the yeah. whole lot on the back shelf? That's a good question. As a teenager in the 1970s, now maybe I didn't dig as deep as I could have done. Um, Let's not talk yeah, about the 70s. <laughs> that's right. One of those things, if you remember yep. them, you weren't there. Um, exactly. But I'm, as a, I'm an electronics engineer, I've always been interested in, in science and technology, how things work. Yep. So I want to have a rational faith. And so for me, what seemed to be credible um, was difficult here. So yeah. So how did you resolve that in the end? Well, in the end, it was actually a creation speaker came to our church, and uh, I was a young married man here in Hamilton in uh, about 1992. Yep. creation speaker came to our church and just outlined a simple presentation showing how the Bible could be tr um, trusted. Genesis stood up to uh, scrutiny, geologically, biologically, archaeologically, and so on. Yep. And for me, that suddenly I had the Bible just go, that makes so much more sense. The Bible almost lifted up in front of me, and I thought, well, I, can, I didn't have all the answers, but it set me on a journey where I could start to research. I got Creation Magazine, and I started to read, yep. and read the Bible more deeply, understanding that it could be trusted. Yeah, and so I for me that was so a start. Many, uh, in the Creation magazine, and we've got a few here, I don't know if you can see them, but um, in the comments from the readers, it's like, thank you so much, A, for the magazine and the articles, but B, for the speakers like yourself that go around churches and, and talk in churches and just go, actually, science says this now. Right, but I mean, use Darwin. Darwin's looking at, I don't know, a. Um, a a seal on the Galapagos Islands. I don't know if they have the seals there, but, but they do. They do. Yes. So you look at it. It's got it's got five phalanges mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a wrist apparatus, two bones, an elbow apparatus, one bone, and a shoulder. And Darwin, 180 years ago, could look at that and go, "I could see how over periods of long, long ages that could develop into the five fingers and, and wrist." That's fine for Darwinian mind uh, Darwinian thinking but when we know today that the only changes that can take place are mitochondrial DNA changes the the letter sequence in the DNA it doesn't make sense anymore so uh, again the science uh, this is what you guys show when you're speaking in, in churches and things the science doesn't back up the theory anymore that's right, and we see that changes that happen because some people say, well, evolution is change. We see change happening, therefore evolution is true. Yeah. But as we point out, evolution is actually a very slippery term. So we're talking about you know, natural selection as a scientific fact. It, it selects away and may give an advantage in certain circumstances, but it's not going to give us the, the goo to you, you know, the, the pond scum to people, yeah. which needs a huge increase in complexity. So as you say, we look at the changes that happen, variation happens within kinds, but it's very clearly bounded by you know, a, a strong ring fence that cannot go outside that. So you're not going to get different creatures changing into different creatures. Yeah, well, what I love, um, and I can't remember which university it is, they've, they've done some, uh, some graphics inside the nucleus of a cell. Mm, that's uh, amazing. And you look at how complex it is in there. And you go, this is, there's no such thing as a, sing, a simple single cell organism. A, a single cell organism is far from simple. If you want something really impressive, one of our scientists, PhD scientists in um, America, Dr. Rob Carter, he's a geneticist. Yeah, I'm, I'm on his biblical yeah, genetics yeah. Facebook. He talks group. about the four yeah. dimensional, uh, gen the genome is like a four dimensional operating yeah. system. It's actually error correction, it's compression, and, and how it expresses itself over time and in three dimensions and so on. It's just n no human understanding of science could be anywhere near that level of complexity. As a software developer, yeah. I know how software, how complex it is. That's nothing compared to the information on yeah. DNA. John Sanford, in his book, uh, Genetic Ent Entropy. Mm -hmm. yep. Genetic and Entropy, yes. Genetic Entropy. And he talks about the primary axiom, the, the um, evolutionary scientists who look at everything, they go, we have to remember there is no creator. Mm. 
Right? That's the, whether, whether we understand this or not is secondary to proving that there is no creator. That's our primary axiom. But I look at things like that, what Robert Carter's doing in that, and, and you go, how can you not see that this was designed? How can you possibly, as, a, as an intelligent human being, imagine that this just happened by chance? We're seeing more and more, Rob, that as um, people go along, often the evidence is so strong, including the evidence for the flood and so on, and talks about in 2 Peter 3, 5 and 6, doesn't it? People willfully overlook this willfully. information. It's, yes. it's, it's, there is a spiritual component. People yep. don't want to go down that track. Um, there's different quotes about people not wanting a divine foot in the door. The, and, That's and right, it, because there's yeah. a spiritual impact on yeah. it. It may cause me to have to live my life differently. Yeah. I don't want to create. I don't want to go there. A lot of people think if, if you can just prove to people that there is a God, that the, the God of the Bible is the real God, if you can just prove that to people, then they will turn to him. Mm. But if you read in Revelation, when the, the tribulation is going on and all this really bad stuff, you find people who are yelling and screaming at God, at Jesus, right? Are they believers? Absolutely. They know who's doing this. The God of the Bible is doing it. Yes. Right? But they're not following him. So even proving, and that's part of what you do, and, and, and the whole apologetics thing with, with biblical creationism is, is trying to prove that there is a God and that he did create everything, but there are still some people who are just going to go, no, I don't want to believe that. I don't want to believe that. That's right. We'd say very strongly you can't prove God exists or can't prove God doesn't exist, does it? (laughs) The same as you can't, you know, creation and evolution, some people try to frame it as we have science, we have evidence, we have facts. You've got your faith. If that gives you comfort, that's fine. So they try to frame it as a science versus faith. But it's actually, uh, the argument is over history. We have the same evidence. And so you're taking the same evidence evidence and interpreting how the history caused that to be and so it's it's actually yep. um, the argument is the same it's science versus science and it, faith, versus faith versus faith, versus faith. evolution it, is a faith as, as John Sanford would say primary axiom versus primary yeah. axiom you believe there is no God I believe there is a God I could use all the evidence and statistics in the world to prove to you that Liverpool are better than Arsenal but you still <laughs> won't believe me you know um, good we were talking a little while ago about uh, Noah's flood mm-hmm. That's one of the big sticking points with the whole ages of the earth thing because the long age of the earth, uh, I don't know, what are we up to nowadays? Because it keeps changing. Well, you, when the, you and I, I were in tell- school, the, the world, the, the, what was it? The universe was 30, what, no, the universe was, I think, 3 billion years old back in the 70s and the earth was something like 300,000 or something. What, what is well, it now? I can't remember now. Okay, I can give you, right at the moment, um, the universe is around 13.7 billion years. Billion, yep. yes. And the 13.7? Earth, the, yep. 13, 13,700 million years old, yep. back to the alleged Big Bang, <laughs> and the earth is 4.54 billion years, right. plus or minus 20.3 million <laughs> years, okay? And we can get into radiometry yep. dating and so on, but that's, that's, just, that's the current consensus. But it keep on, changes. But that's actually yep. obtained from a meteorite sample. Okay. That date, okay? But one of, one of the reasons for them. I mean, not, not that we believe that. We're just, no, no, but that's, that's what yeah. they're saying. It's so accurate, um, supposedly. So the, the reason for that is because of the, the, the strata and all these sorts of things, but uh, an understanding of creation science, and particularly the catastrophe of Noah's flood, actually answers every single one of those questions. It does, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I work in um, electronics with an application to environmental monitoring, so I do a lot of work with hydrologists, geologists, geomorphologists, and so on, and we just see the strata all around the world. And for me, it's one of those things, I wouldn't have seen it unless I believed. Yep. When you look at the world, the evidence for the flood is just everywhere. You know, we're looking at continental-wide erosion, layers of rock, fossilisation, chalk beds. Yep. You're talking about a massive catastrophe that we don't see anything like today. Yeah. And so the interpretation of the rock layers is what led to this idea of deep time. You know, uh, because James Hutton many, looked at many, many, many layers. Yeah, I mean, that's the, right. the, the whole Grand Canyon tour and everything, all these different layers. Yeah, that's right. you know, that, one's, that one's 40 million years old and that one's only 2,000 years old. So the whole thing is, is right. People think they look, it's called uni- uniformitarianism. Yep. You know, the present is the key to the past. We measure things today. We extrapolate it back and say it's been the same it's way uniform, over time. So slowly, slowly, grain by grain yep. over years. But when we look at real science, we look at real present day uh, events, we see that things can happen very quickly. Yeah. I love Mount St. Helens. When was that? 1980? 1980. 1980, yeah. 80, yeah. And, and it created what I think is called the, the mini, mini. Um, Grand Canyon. Yeah. One fortieth scale. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically everything, everything that evolutionists use 
in this whole system of dating the Earth at X million years old mm. was created in a week Disfuse, yeah. because of Mount St. Helens. And yet they still refuse to believe it. They do. And even now, more and more, the whole thing about like granites, they, they form very quickly. They understand now, not millions of years of slow cooling. They realise that granites are formed quickly. So many of the old ideas of geological rock formation are being overturned. Yeah. I've got a theory on oil production. Do you want to hear it? Okay, yes. So we know you, oil is created by, you get one of the biomass and it's squashed together and the heat heat and everything, right? I reckon when the Earth's tectonic plates move, that's an enormous pressure and heat. So I think oil can actually be created or made very, very quickly, which has been proven in laboratories because they've done it very quickly with extreme pressure and extreme heat. So when, to, to me, when the geologists go, oh, we're running out of the oil reserves... I'm sitting there going, yeah, you just need another big earthquake. <laughs> well, certainly I'm, I'm not an expert on the oil production, but I think yeah, some oil reserves are created from non-organic, sorry, non-biological yeah, yeah. forms. But also coal is testament to the flood, the huge coal beds we have. You imagine the flood, all the vegetation before the flood being ripped up, massive floating mats of vegetation buried under huge amounts of strata. And, and I mean, there's the things we don't, we don't ask the questions because we're, we're programmed to not ask the questions. Mm. Why are there massive beds of this? Why isn't it uniform all the way through? Why aren't the fossils that we find uniform all the way through? Why are they not spread all over the face of the Earth? If the Earth is X million years old, or billion years, what is it now, 3 billion? 4.4 4. 4. 4. 4. Yeah. 4. Yeah. 4. 4 billion and counting. Um, why isn't it uniformly spread all over the place? You know why? You know it just it just isn't. But we're not programmed to ask those questions. We're simply programmed to accept the answers that we're given. So one of the things we do often in our um, creation ministries talks is talking about fossils because we're taught that you know something dies in the open and it sinks to the bottom of the sea and it gets covered up slowly over deep time yep. and fossilized. But if you look at things that die in the around the world now, things uh, whale dies, fish dies, roadkill, and so on. Things decompose and are scavenged very quickly. Yeah. So where are these huge amounts of animals waiting to be fossilized? Yeah. And so you need something to be buried very quickly to set up the conditions for fossilization. And we find uh, again a lot of the fossils. They talk about uh, like fossil, not fossil beds, but what do they call it? The the, the, the big areas. The bone beds. Yeah, bone yeah, beds. Yeah. yeah. The, so there are. They're, they're all bunched together. Yeah. Different species all jumbled together. All jumbled yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Being washed into a basin and, yeah. By a great big flood yeah, of water. That's right. So again, when we look at the world around us, we look at events we can observe, we see that things don't get fossilised today. Do you talk to many uh, evolutionary scientists in your role with CMI? <sighs> Uh, no. No, okay. Well, occasionally yeah. somebody at a church maybe you know, will be a scientist and they'll come up and have a yeah. chat afterwards. Right. Sometimes a robust chat, but yeah. So how, uh, we'll, we'll switch the questioning then. The, there's a, the robust chats, there's a lot of Christians who, will, who hold on to evolutionary theory mm. or, or some part of it. I mean, one I came across uh, was the gap theory, mm. right? So okay, I can believe that God created Adam and Eve and the, that Genesis 1 is timeline. And yes, it was about 6,000 years ago mm. and God created uh, mankind and created all the animals and all the fish. But there was this gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And I know that because of the long ages of the earth, because of the rocks. Mm. You must come across that a lot. Not so much, but I certainly have, and we've actually got a really good tract about that. And that's the idea that there was a so-called Lucifer's flood. Yes. And that yeah. the idea, and it's part of it comes from the King James Bible, it talks about you know, the, uh, replenishing the earth. And that, that's because the English word replenish has changed. And so people think it must have been destroyed and God's recreated, reforming, yeah. you know, repairing. Yeah. But there's nothing in Scripture about Lucifer's, Lucifer's flood. <laughs> And um, it's an attempt to bring in the deep time into scripture. Yeah, to, so it's largely yeah. discredited, but some people yeah. still hold to it. Yeah, um, but it, it's trying it's trying to make sense of the Bible based on my scant knowledge of science. That's right. Which we should never do. The Bible can make sense of itself. It can, and often you know the, the whole idea of. Um, outside ideas being pushed in and actually they, they have a greater authority than scripture don't they yeah so because secular science says this and all the scientists can't be wrong therefore we have to adapt the bible modify the bible to fit the current thinking yeah yeah 
So uh, there's an old story about flies and what they eat, and you know, <laughs> sixty billion flies can't be wrong. Um, what's your favourite discussion when, when you come up? You know, when when somebody comes up to you in a church meeting or some other meeting and and says so and so, and you go, yes, mm. that's my favourite one to debate. What is it? If you're looking at science, there's different things, but for me, in, increasingly, I think in the world we we're um facing so many changes. I'm, I'm really encouraged by people who maybe have young people who are struggling with their identity or struggling with hope and so on, and knowing that we've got answers, we can trust God's word. So what really thrills me increasingly is people seeing that there is a way forward to give hope to their family or their own personal faith to be expanded. Yeah. So as they open up the Bible, they can trust it. So what yeah. is that hope? Yeah. The hope that we have you know, a God who loves us, we're created in his image, and we have a way that we can come back into relationship with him through Jesus. Yeah. And the fact that the world we, as we see it is just is broken, not the way he intended. And so for many people, understand that they are special. Because so evolution says that we're just evolved animals. We're nothing special. Yeah. We're just a, a plague upon the earth. So imagine I come to you and I'm a person with no hope and I'm struggling with what you've just told me in the meeting that you were speaking at and uh, I don't see how that can be. And, you know, I've been in the church and uh, you know, I heard what you said about your dad being a, you know in the church but not knowing Jesus. Um, what am I going to do? Mm. Michael, what am I going to do? I'm lost. Mm. Well, it's again, coming, finding out where they're at, and maybe part of the journey I've found is asking people, even people who say, oh, I'm an atheist, I'm a secular humanist, okay, that's interesting, well, what's been your journey? So I find increasingly, if you listen to a person, how they've been influenced or things that have happened, you know, like you say, maybe they've been uh, uh, impacted by a church that was maybe hypocritical or legalistic, or they've been disappointed in prayer or something, Everyone has a journey to where they come to a point of believing something. Yeah. And so if you can anchor onto that and find that, well, I used to go to church, but now I'm, I'm a non-believer, then you can anchor onto that, find out where they're at, and then ask the Lord to really show you keys that you can use to encourage them to get back to their faith or to open the Bible or share the gospel in a, yeah. in a plain way. So. Yeah, everyone has a different story, don't they? No, oh, we do. We all do, which mm. is which is what makes us as human and makes the world such a wonderful place. Uh, you were, was it an electrical engineer, electronic engineer, electronic software, software engineer. developer. Yeah. So what what area do you main? I mean, we're transitioning right off okay, creation at yes. the moment. What what area do you do you specialize in? Well, over the years, um, I've right since a child always been interested in science and technology. So, um, you know, hardware and software design was yeah. my key area. And our, our company works in environmental monitoring, so we build little data loggers that collects information. From maybe the, So that little wind thing down the road from uh, me? That well, well, that's the sort of thing that collects information, feeds yep. it to our loggers that store it up and send it back to a regional council or whatever, and then they raise alarms and tell you about how big your flood's going to be or okay, you yep. know, what the soil moisture's like or and so on. So it's measuring environmental information uh, for government departments. Okay. What fascinates you about it? What, or do, no. <laughs> when was the last time you just said, God, that's brilliant? Mm. Can you remember that? Well, I think, again, as God is an en he's the ultimate engineer. So I look at a bird flying and so on. I'm an electronics engineer. Yep. And I think software development, we are, we are creators, aren't we? Yep. we, we um, whether you're an artist, a musician, a, a software guru, whatever, you're actually taking God's uh, image of creativity and making something. That, that gives me a thrill. Yep. You can rearrange ones and zeros and make it do something. That's yep. uh, pretty cool. Are you into the ones and zeros? You're yeah, coding well, and all, everything? Always, yeah. always arranging ones yeah. and zeros, yeah. I, I, can <laughs> see, I can see Kyle uh, over in the office is starting to salivate. goes, yes. Another okay, coder, right. you know, Another, yeah. somebody that speaks the real language of God, not <laughs> exactly. that English stuff. But I think for me, again, so it's the whole thing, but I also enjoy earth science. I love um, tramping and I love being out in the outdoors. And so field trips to go yeah. to a river or to look at strata or look at um, whatever is really great as well. So yeah. to be able to blend science and technology with field work is good. Isn't, isn't um, geology and biology simply God's science? I think so. Yes, really? it's, yeah. it's it's you know it's it's his it's his coding all the way through. We'd say I mean he's just the ultimate in engineers and designers and so yeah. on. And so um, I think for me, yeah, the whole thing it talks in Romans one, doesn't it, about the things of God are plain to see, you know, through yeah. the things He's created. And so His fingerprints are everywhere, whether it's a bird flying or just seeing. Yeah. My, my wife Desma works in hematology with in veterinary hematology, and this is the design of blood, the, the clotting cascade. Just see the design, the complexity. Yeah, it's just awesome. So I go, wow, Lord, you're clever. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's just that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I love that. I love that about the creation magazines, uh, and because you have everything in there from the biology to the geology to the um, uh, out in space, 
all sorts of things, and, yes. and you, you just go. I've got to admit, though, some of the some of the stuff on I'm not really into the geology articles. You know what? Okay, no, 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 I prefer the biology ones. But but you just look at it and you go, God, that's just. It's incredible. It is, yeah. You know, and some of the, some of the some of the animals that in their dinosaurs. How, how often do you have to explain that dinosaurs are in the Bible? That that comes up, and dinosaurs are a great, especially with young people. We find dinosaurs really are a point of contact. Yeah, because we're taught you know, over and over again that dinosaurs died out sixty five million years ago. Fred Flintstone taught me different. That's right. Well, I think the Flintstones were maybe more accurate historically <laughs> than some of the, you know, they had. But um, we just see that dinosaurs are a great way to share. The truth of God's word, you yeah. know, the whole thing, and so Scripture is clear that God, on day six, God created you know, all the land animals and humans. I love there's a, a video in a book that uh, you have at CMI called I think it's called Dragons and Dinosaurs. Mm, yeah, and dire, dire dragons. Yeah, dire dragons. Yes. Is that the one? Yeah. Um, and if if I because it's a while since I've watched the video of it, but uh, it shows how the different dragons around, particularly around Europe. Actually, the, the pictures that they drew of the dragons actually match up with the bones we've now found. So the pictures from four or five hundred years ago of the dragon now matches the bones of the dinosaurs that were living in that area. Exactly, yeah. And, and people, people say, well, maybe they dug up the bones and worked out what they look like. But if and you, then we you, buried you, them you, again so we could find them in the yeah. 20th century. But, uh, yeah, there's, that's right. There's so much evidence for historical dinosaurs because yeah. the word dinosaur is a fairly recent um, thing. I'm not sure if you knew that, Rob. That, it's uh, yeah, like 18, 1841, 1840 yeah. Before then they were yeah. called, yeah, dragons. Yeah. And there's actually even the site of Botanica talk about sea dragons and so yeah. on back in the old yeah. ones. So uh, one of the other things about um, dinosaurs is that, you know, that they're finding increasing numbers of dinosaur bones that are not fossilised, not fully fossilised, yeah, including soft that's, tissues that's and blood cells and so on in dinosaur bones that cannot be 65 million years old. Yeah, and, and almost every article, every um, edition of the Creation magazine, there's a new one mm. of somebody who's found elasticised DNA or yeah, collagen, and, collagen and, and osteocalcin, which according to the evolutionary theory and I suppose according to creation theory as well, cannot last more than just a few thousand years uh, and yet... We found it in a 65 million year old T Rex. And even older, you know, up to 135 million year old you know, hadrosaurs and so How on. How do they explain that? Well, they try and desperately to try to find ways, including things like iron enrichment, you know, using haemoglobin and so on. And that may explain how things lasted for a few thousand years since the flood, but not 65 million years old. No. Are they starting to uh, do a bit of a Jurassic Park on us now and, and, and get this elasticized? No, uh, blood cells and suck out some DNA. And my understanding is that DNA is a very complex molecule and it breaks down quickly. So even though there's recognisable DNA there, it's so badly fragmented that it's not. You know, there's no okay. way you can recover it. So Jurassic Park is exactly that. It's great science fiction. <laughs> so it's it's like a book that's been in the fire and you know it's a book mm. and you know it's got letters on you can it. See you see fragments can't, of it. You can't it, read anything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm not a scientist, you know, um, but I go, how can any thinking human being looking at the evidence that we have now still believe in long ages in dino, what do they call it, goo to you via the zoo yeah, that's right. Korea, uh, evolution? Uh, how can you look at anything like that and still believe that? Well, there's a range of reasons, I think. One is because many people haven't even heard the other side. It talks in uh, uh, Proverbs 18, 17. It said one person brings their account, and it seems credible until you hear the other side. Yeah. And that's right. So many people have not heard evidence to counter what we're taught. But also, I think in uh, many scientists, it's just reinforcement idea that everyone believes that everyone else believes it, so it becomes yeah. a self-fulfilling idea. Yeah. But also there's some of its political, um, sorry, um, professional pride. People don't want to let go of this because there'll be a cost. Yeah. The credibility or it's my like job. me trying to admit that Manchester United are actually a reasonably <laughs> good football team. Yeah, not as good as Liverpool, obviously, but, but reasonably okay, good. I, I yeah. couldn't comment. Um, I mean, you've got uh, Dr. Robert Carter, a, a geneticist, uh, you know, um, uh, DNA scientist, and John Sanford, who wrote that book, Genetic Entropy. Uh, they, had, Robert, I don't know so well. John was... Top, he's the inventor of the gene gun. He's he's he like up there with geneticists. 
He was he was one of the leading geneticists at Cornell University, yeah. and he co-developed the what they call the gene gun, yeah. which is used to do a lot of transgenic development in plants and so on. So we're not talking is, Bill Smith from no, no, Waikato no. University. We're talking one of the world's top geneticists, and he is saying he looks at at his specialty field mm. and goes, "There is no way this evolved." Exactly, and quite the opposite, as you say, we're looking at our genomes, and that's where the, his book, The Genetic Entropy, you know, the whole yep. phenomenon of things decaying, falling apart. So we're seeing, we're actually going towards extinction. Yeah. We see our genomes just breaking down. Natural selection slows the damage down, but we're still going downhill. Yeah, it's, uh, in fact, that's one of the one of my favourite books that, that I've ever read is that book. And, and he shows in, in two, um, in the two parts of the book, number one, he talks about uh, the mutations that we're passing on to the next generation. Right, yeah. And he goes back to um, what he calls the, the perfect human being with no mutations, which is X number of generations. I can't remember the X, but, but he goes, which is roughly 6,000 years. That's surprise, right. surprise. But in the second part of the book, he shows how there is not enough time, even in the evolutionary time frame, for one beneficial, just one beneficial mutation because it takes so long to do that, and, and we're not told that. We're, we're, we're told that, again, these five phalanges of a seal could turn into fingers. That's right. It's one of the things is called Haldane's Dilemma, the idea that... Haldane's Hal- Dilemma. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Mr. Haldane, he was a scientist back in the 1950s and so on, geneticist, and he talked about this idea of, you know, he talked about a, a mutation being fixed, it has to spread right through the population and become fixed. Yeah. And so you know, our alleged common ancestor with chimpanzees, you know, six million years ago, there's nowhere near enough time even for a, a small number of mutations, let alone the millions that have to be. Yeah. And so deep time doesn't fix it. And th- this is why the three billion year old universe that you and I grew up with in the 70s is now 13 billion years old yeah, yeah. because they have to keep extending and extending and extending the time frame to fit everything in. Mm. But it still doesn't work. Time is actually the enemy. They say time is the miracle worker. But actually, fact, when you look at it, yeah, time just makes it worse. I remember one of the books I narrated for uh, Creation Ministries International was Deep Time Deception. That's right, um, yeah. It's a really Lord. good book, that one. Michael Lord? Yes, the, yeah. the, the Deep Time Deception, yeah. yeah. And it is, it's a deception, it's, and it's purposely being pushed on us. Mm. That's right. That's a really good book because it talks about the how the whole idea of deep time came in, you know, through James Hutton and Charles Lyell and right through. Then Darwin picked that up, and he needed deep time to make evolution credible. So there's been this series of thinkers who have taken it through to being popularized to the point where it's now standard mantra. Yeah. Um, but even when we look around, we see it is a deception. Yeah, and it's it's such a deception that it is accepted even in Christendom. Mm. That even and again we use the gap theory. Even even if you go, yes, I believe God created Adam and Eve as the first human beings six thousand years ago. I still, because of this deep time deception, I have to believe mm-hmm. in a billion year billion year old Earth. I have to believe in a universe that's billions of years old because of that deception. Mm. And that's right, we, so we see some one of the other compromise um, things I say respectfully is called progressive creationism, the idea that they accept the billions of years and you know, the evolution of humans from an hominid kind, but God supernaturally breathed his spirit into, oh, you yeah. know, selected, so you know, about 60,000 years ago, and Adam and Eve were real people, yeah. you know, from the uh, various hominins, they were selected and God breathed into them, and that's how it started. Yeah, but so you God, have, God's looking down on the earth and he's going, yeah, um, that, 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 those two there okay, look pretty those good. Two, yeah. Yeah. But of course we look up the you know the fossil record shows us um, suffering, death, all sorts of horrible things. So the yeah. alleged ancestors would have been killing and doing all sorts of things. Yeah. So well, this, this comes to something we were talking about over coffee before. Um, with if if you take out a literal Adam and Eve and sin entering through Adam, mm-hmm. you have to take out so much more of the Bible. Um, and, and part of it is, uh, again, one of the things with Know My Faith is we want to teach Bible uh, uh, people a, a greater knowledge of their Bibles. Absolutely. And you go, okay, um, if you want to take out Genesis 1, you have to take out these verses from Romans over here where Paul says sin entered through Adam mm-hmm. and death through sin. You can't have death before Adam sinned. So you can't have any of these animals, hominids or whatever dying before then. If you take that out, um, you've got to do this. Um, and it's a, it's a lack of, of real knowledge of the Word of God, to me, that allows Christians to go, oh no, well I can still believe in this and I can still believe in this. 
That's, that's the key thing. Some people try to explain that by saying, well, Adam and Eve, it's just a spiritual death. You know, physical death's been around, but the, well, the, the curse was actually a spiritual, spiritual death. death. So we have to ask then, why is it, and, you know, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins? And why did Jesus have to die a physical death to pay the yeah. price for a spiritual death, isn't it? So yeah. the whole thing, you know, we Adam and Eve died spiritually, because you know, it yep. said, on the day you eat, you shall die. And the Hebrew actually means, on dying, you shall die. Yes. And so they died spiritually on the spot, yep. and then the process of physical death began. Which is, which is if you take John Sanford's book, this is where these mutations came in. Mm, they started, that's right, the it's, whole of creation. started us dying. Mm. We see, we, I like to think of it as you know, God cursing, but in actual fact, God's just, he's actually re- withdrawing some of his sustaining power, some of his blessing, isn't yep, it? Therefore, yep. uh, things yep. started to fall apart. Yeah, that makes much more sense. It doesn't, so, it's, yeah. the, you know, so yeah. he just said, okay, I love you, but you, you've got free will, you've chosen to run the place, yep. I'm stepping back and things will start to fall apart. And yep. that's what we see, the curse is actually God taking some sustaining power away. Yep. And, and again, if you understood the Bible better, if we knew the Bible better, we would see that. Mm. And we would go, ah, yeah, I get it. Um, so it's so important to understand that these things, the horrible things we see in the world, are not the way God created it. No, yeah. no, no. And, and we have to understand, you know, when it says God cursed, again, it can, mm. it, yes, He can curse. He's mm. got the right to he do has. that. But it all, also can be because you've done this. Mm. There's a consequence, right? isn't there? If you want to jump out of the plane without your parachute, mm. don't blame the pilot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good right? way, isn't it? Yeah. the pilot said, put the parachute on. If you chose not to do that, well, you know, your end is in your own hands. Mm. So let's go back to the flood, which is uh, another one of those sticking points mm. for us. Um, one of the theories with Noah's flood is that it was just a local flood. <laughs> didn't, didn't wipe out all the earth. Mm. Exactly. That's right. Yes. How do we handle that? Well, one of the talks I found very effective because we talked about compromise ideas. We again, I say respectfully, people who don't take scripture as plainly written, you know, the whole thing. So the flood is a key thing that is a, t- a real um, litmus paper on how you take scripture, because Genesis, um, you know, chapter six to nine talk about a global flood that affected the whole of the earth yep. and wiped out all air breathing animals, and the ark was a place of sanctuary. And so, how do we deal with that? So, is it? Total myth, just you know, maybe derived from Near Eastern ideas like the Gilgamesh epic, yep. and Genesis is a corruption of that, which I can talk about later if you like. Uh, or maybe it was a local flood around the Black Sea area. You know, seems yep. credible. Or it was actually, as stated in Scripture, a global flood that affected the a whole earth. Global. So we got to decide how we how we deal with this, and we got so much evidence that it was a global catastrophe that affected the whole earth. And yeah. uh, the, the, the local flood is now totally discredited. I mean, it doesn't stack up scripturally too. Why would uh, Noah have to build an yeah, ark? Why not just leave? 150 yeah. metre long ark for a year? Because many people think yeah. the flood was only 40 days. But no, the, it rained yeah. for 40 days. Yeah. The flood, the ark was actually on the... On the water it closed for, up the for door, 12 months. Yeah, yeah. 371 yeah. days, yeah. So that's a huge amount of time. They yeah. could have just migrated out of the area. That's right, just gone and lived on a mountain yeah. top. Yeah. But, I mean, that's the other thing, too, is you talk at the mountains and they go, well, you know, what, you got floodwaters above Mount Everest? Yeah. Go, no, because there wasn't a Mount Everest before the flood. That's right. And so, again, we're looking at what we call catastrophic plate tectonics. So the earth before the flood was diff- very different to what it is now. Yeah. We don't know what the, uh, the topography of the earth looked like before the flood. Yep. But it certainly Mount Everest wasn't there before. Well, I mean, we know part of it, and, and, and proper science shows us this when we look at Gondwana land, hmm. which, again, um, supports what the Bible says. It says God said, let there be dry land. Let hmm. there be a separation in dry land. That's it good. wasn't dry lands, plural. It wasn't Australia, New Zealand, S- South America. It was Gondwana land, which for some reason began to split. Hmm. Exactly. And become the continents and the islands. Now, Noah's flood and the, uh, the the opening of up of the fountains of the deep is a great time for that to happen. It is, and, and the whole and we see so many uh, great evidences for that. And definitely, the planet the um, planet has been reshaped. Yeah. Continents have moved. Still being reshaped. Yeah. But again, the idea of uniformitarianism, we measure the rate at which plates are moving now and think it's always been the same way. Yeah. There's good evidence uh, for rapid plate tectonics and the uplifting of Southern Alps, the Andes, um, the Himalayas and so on, pushed up yep. after the flood or during the flood. The, 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 that uniformitarianism and the understanding, it's uh, tree rings is a great example because I think I remember reading something recently because uh, we all grew up with you know, the tree rings, one ring per year. Mm. 
That's what we grew up with. So you chop the tree in half and count the rings, you go, well, that tree was 70 years old. But that's not actually the case, is it? It's, it's um, You can have um, bad weather or floods or whatever can actually affect it and, and grow a different ring. So you could have multiple rings in one year. That's, that's a really good point. And again, I'm not an expert, although we've um, got a really good resource on our website about tree ring dating yeah. and climate change and so on. Um, but yeah, so generally trees in temperate areas do grow one ring per year. But generally. You, generally. But if you look like bristlecone pines in California, yeah. they um, are under great stress. They actually will put down a, a new ring as soon as they get any moisture at all. So it's interesting. And they've done experiments to show that yeah, multiple rings can grow within a year. Yeah. Yeah. So... so so again, when we, we can look at the tectonic plate movement today, and this is what the, the uniformitarianism, or ten, those guys, they, they, they go, the plates are moving at this rate today. We know that there was a Gondwana land, so let's turn that clock backwards and we've got That's exactly. 4.6 billion years. But they don't want to take into account the catastrophe, the enormous catastrophe of the flood. <laughs> That's right, and, and we again we just see the evidence all around the world. You know, just the erosion. You look at if you, whether you've been to Monument Valley in the States. You know, it's that classic sort of huge area with these plugs sticking out of it. Yeah. If you look at the the flood idea of all the water draining off the continents after the flood, washing off huge amounts of sediment, we don't see anything today of that size. No. So people often look at layers even around the Waikato here. We see the Taupo eruption. Well, I don't see any evidence for a flood in there. Yep. You're just looking way too small that we're talking a catastrophe that's yes. massive. Yeah. 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 And again, we, we, what we talked about a while ago was with the whole Mount St. Helens thing. We saw that. We saw a, a, it on a smaller scale, but we saw what a massive flood could do uh, to the geology, well, putting the layers down of the, the, the um, from the explosion. It was just yeah. It was like God saying, "Look, I, I want to explore. I want to show you what <laughs> happens during the flood. Let me show you." Even right down to the trees in Spirit Lake, yeah, the trees yeah. rubbing together, forming bark, and then starting to form peat layers. And so yeah, we can see yeah. the whole idea of coal formation and just um, yeah, so many exciting things that came out of that event. So, uh, why don't we want to believe that God created the world six thousand years ago the way He said He did? So I think, again, it's peer pressure, it's the what we're taught, um, and a bit, there's a spiritual consequence. If, if you're not a Christian, to accept the Bible means that you have to do something about the God revealed in the Bible. Yeah. But for Christians accepting deep time, part of it is they don't um, know there's an, another way to int- see Scripture as plainly written, because the science seems o- so overwhelmingly yeah. true. How do you go against all this? these knowledgeable scientists? They can't be wrong. Yeah. I'm only a layman. How do, I, how do I... So it's very hard to stand up against that if you don't know, and I understand that. Yeah, um, which is why we need... Um, yeah. Where's the latest one? That's the latest one? That's the latest one. That's the current version. Pinnipeds. I didn't, didn't even know they yeah. were called pinnipeds. I don't know yeah. if you can see that there. Sea um, lions, walruses, You've got... Seals. Uh, a lot of these articles in here, mm-hmm. and we're going to say there's there's two magazines, so we'll talk about the second one in a moment. A lot of these articles are written by PhD scientists yeah. who are experts in their field. So when you go, oh, how can I just as a layman compete against the, you know all these scientists, the evolutionists? Well, Creation Magazine's a great way. And then you've got the the technical journal, crea- the journal, the journal of, of creation. creation. Yes, that one. I, I mean, I'm reading a book at the moment. It's called The Everyday Life of an Algorithm, <laughs> which is great. And it starts off with the simple algorithm, but then shows how much more complicated it, it has to get. I can read the Creation Magazine, but my head hurts when I read the Journal of Creation. That's so in-depth technical, it's written by scientists, experts in their field, from with scientific language. And it's peer-reviewed as well. It's yeah. fully peer-reviewed. Yeah, which means... It means that basically people of the same qualifications are actually examining yeah. the information, yeah. peer reviewing it, editing it. And they're and not sh- all creationists, are no. they, the peers? No. no. And again, it's one of the exciting things too, to obviously Creation Ministries International, we are one of the ministries of, of several around the world yeah. who have a lo- love of God's word, a, a love of science too, so we're not alone. There's many like-minded ministries also yeah. beavering away, we work together, and it's a great way just to really share with people. Um, yeah. I found too the um, the whole um, intelligent design. Now, a lot of people think intelligent design is a term that Christians came up with, but it's not. It's actually, it was actually a term that that secular scientists came up with okay. to explain the fact that what they were looking at must have been designed. That's right. Intelligent design. The the intelligent design movement is useful. 
that they don't go as far as saying who the designer no, is. Because That's they, right. They, they could be aliens. We yeah, can't exactly. allow a god, but this has been designed. <laughs> but we can't allow a god, but it's been designed. As a professor, uh, mm. Professor Richard Dawkins talked about biology is the study of things that have the appearance of being designed, but we know they're not. <laughs> yeah, see, so again, we look at something plainly, you know. So it's again, it's again, it's a worldview thing, isn't it? We don't want to look at design or accept yeah. design because of the designer. You cannot get long ages just by reading the Bible. No. That has to be inserted into your theology. The reason why people want long ages is because they do not want to be accountable to the God of the Bible for the sin in their life. That's right. That's what it boils down to, doesn't it? It is. Michael, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. Thank you, Rob. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Excellent. Michael Cook from Creation Ministries International. You can check out their website, which is simply creation.com. And join us again next time on the Know My Faith Monday podcast.